to give us his encouragement. Very important. Good morning, friends and family. You are permitted to add my own words of welcome on this beautiful first, the second, probably the first Sunday of December. And to add also a special welcome to those people who join us in consciousness by watching and listening to us on the World Wide Web. Let's listen for all together. Through me, God blesses all in the world. Can we say that? Through me, God blesses all in the world. I give my gift of peace, joy, light, love, and plenty. I give my gift of peace, joy, light, love, and plenty. I give it freely and lavishly. I give it freely and lavishly. I am the gift I bring to Christmas. I am the gift I bring to Christmas. And so it is. You know, friends, in the Christian tradition, this time is known as Advent. The word comes from the Latin adventus, which means coming. So the Christian world anticipates the coming of Jesus. And as a child, one of my treasured possessions was an advent calendar made by my dad for me specially. It featured a picture of a beautiful house with a little window for each day of advent. And if Dennis, my brother, was especially um, good to me, sharing his peanut butter sandwiches and so on, I would allow him the privilege of opening the odd window every now and then. I can't remember them all, but I do remember the word behind the first window for the first day of Advent, and it was who? Now, I remember it well because one Advent, it got me into serious problems. You see, there was a little girl next door with the same name. And so my, as I opened the window and said, Hope, my father began to say the rosary, and he said, Hail Mary, full of grace. And I said, Hope is a little girl who won't wash her face. <laughs> so I was dispatched to my bedroom to write an essay on the meaning of hope. <laughs> we in the New Thought Movement give a metaphysical interpretation to Advent, though, and to the Christmas season. In that, we celebrate the coming of the Christ not as a person or as a personality, but as the principle of everyone's sonship with God. So when I say all people's sonship, you can say daughtership if you like, uh, to be politically correct. When I say all people, I mean all people. All religions, all races, all beliefs, all creeds, and all spiritual practices. Everyone is heir to the kingdom, and everyone is a son or a daughter of God. It is for me significant then that our beloved Dr. Elmer chose the first Sunday of Advent, the first Sunday of the coming, a Sunday which in my childhood years symbolized hope, that she chose this particular day to merge with the infinite, and as my friend Sharon Thomas put it when I spoke to her right after her internal transition, Sharon said on the first Sunday Advent, she moved fully into her Christ nature. Isn't that beautiful? She just completely embodied that which she had taught us all her life, the coming of the Christ in every human heart. Over the years of her illumined ministry, Dr. Elba fed countless people spiritually. And it was in her class on the Bible that I, I acquired the taste for regularly reading the scriptures. And so I titled my encouragement today, and I take it from Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I'd like to share a Christmas story of hope told by Joel Ben Izzy in 1971. And the story is called simply The Orange. And you'll be surprised to hear where the story of hope. I'll tell it in Benny's words. When I was 12, I lived in Los Angeles and had to ride the bus to go everywhere. 
Like most kids my age, I dreamed of a car and freedom. But at that point of my life, my freedom depended on riding the bus that I hated. I would sit right behind the bus driver in the handicapped reserved space because it had more room. Like a typical obnoxious adolescent, I'm so glad they're with the Reverend Michael this morning, I would glare at anyone who tried to sit next to me, and usually I was left alone. This is a belligerent, defiant young man sitting there behind me the bus driver in a seat reserved for handicapped passengers. But he continues. One day, we stopped in Fairfax, the Jewish neighborhood in Los Angeles, and a thin elderly man got on, walking with a cane, with a cane, and holding a grocery bag. Sure enough, he came right up to me and began to sit down next to me. Disgruntled and irritated, I begrudgingly moved over and suddenly stared out the window. He looked me up and down for a moment, taking in my tattoo on my upper arm, which stood for a gang I had just joined. He reached into his shopping bag and pulled out an orange that he showed to me. What is this, he asked. I remember looking at him as if he was crazy and thought, oh, I really looked out on this trip. Sarcastically, I said, it's an orange. Do I win the jackpot? But still he persisted. What do you think of it? I took the orange and examined it. <coughs> well, I said, it's kind of small and a little green, but it's probably orange inside. But even if it were all green, you'd still call it an orange. You'd never call it a green. <laughs> but it's just an orange. Impatiently, I handed it back to him. He looked at me for a while, and then he said, you don't understand, do you? For the first time since he had gotten on the bus, I totally agree. I didn't understand anything this man was saying. He sat there looking at the orange, and then looking at me. I'm not from around here, he said. I had gathered as much since he had a thick European accent. I was born in Germany before the Second World War and spent the war in a place called Auschwitz. Ever heard of it? I had heard about World War II and the Nazi prison camps and told him so. But did they tell you about Auschwitz? Did they tell you how cold it was? Did they tell you that it was a world of black and white? I didn't say anything, so he continued. Everything there was black and white or gray. The SS guards wore black uniforms and black boots. When the white snow fell, it was pure white. The barbed wire on the fence was black, and we prisoners wore uniforms and black and white stripes. Underneath, our skin was pale and white from lack of sun, but the numbers they tattooed on us were black. When the snow fell, it turned to gray from the ashes that fell from the black snow stacks. And the food was gray. It was soup, always soup, but the soup was made from a big barrel of water, maybe 50 gallons. The water turned gray, like water from dirty dishes. But this was our food, and each day we would stand in a long line, each of us holding a tin bowl waiting to get soup. What time I had, I spent trying to stay warm. Our clothes were a thin cloth, nothing more. And I used to walk near the fence 
looking for black and white newspaper so I could crumple the newspaper up and put it in my clothes. I remember one very cold day, I found a piece of newspaper, black and white. It was actually Christmas Day. It was Christmas Day, and a miracle was about to happen. When I picked it up, there was something orange beneath it. I had not seen anything orange in months. I thought it might be something good, but I knew if I were caught with it, the guard would shoot me and take it away. So I pretended to stumble. And as the guard turned away to laugh, I quickly scooped it up and put it in the black and white newspaper. I hid it in my clothes, and back at the barracks, I hid it in a dark black hole in the wall. That night, I held that orange, smelled it for a long time, and put it back in the dark hole in the wall. I was starving, but somehow I knew if I ate it, there would be nothing more left for me. No orange, no hope. So even though it was Christmas, I knew that hope would be needed more in the end after the orange was gone. I said a prayer. Oh God, if I live, may I always put oranges in my children's stockings to remember this day of the Christmas orange miracle. However, the next day turned out to be selection when the weakest would be separated and taken out to be shot or gassed. As the light shone on me, there was a long pause that seemed like an eternity. And at the last minute, the guard said, right. And I knew that I would live for at least a few days until the next selection. The whole time I had been standing there waiting for my fate, I was angry at myself for not eating the orange. What have I been saving it for? I could have never had a had an opportunity again to eat it. So that night, that night, Christmas night, I pulled out the orange and ate one section of it. I will tell you, young man, nothing before or since has tasted so sweet. What I tasted was the taste of pure love. And so I shared a section of the orange with some of the prisoners in, my, in the barracks. I saved that one segment in that dark hole. And every day I would scratch a little piece of the skin and sniff the smell of freedom and remember the taste of that orange in my mouth. It was cold that winter, and so that one segment lasted right through to the spring. And so when spring arrived, the snow began to melt, and flowers began to bloom. Yes, even in Auschwitz, flowers bloomed. And with spring, with spring, my son, hope sprang eternal. Our camp was liberated the day after I ate that last segment. Orange. I was freed and eventually came here to America. But you see, the orange saved my life. My children are all grown now, 
but they fill their children's stockings with oranges too to keep the story alive for another generation. Benizin, who said the story, says, the bus drew to a stop and the old man got up. But before he left, he turned to me and he gave me the orange. And then he said simply, my son, remember the sweet things in life. Remember the sweet things in life. And he got off the bus and I never saw him again. But I also never looked at an orange the same way again. And now 20 years later, I fill my children's stockings every Christmas Eve with an orange to tell them the story of hope. In his meditations for help, for self-help in the science of mind textbook, the founder of our movement, Dr. Ernest Holmes, writes, and I quote, hope cannot die. Eternal hope is forever warm and fresh within me. The deathless hope built upon the rock of sure knowledge. O hope sublime, O life supreme, behold I come to thee as a tired child, and thou dost rekindle within me the fires of faith. Strong, swift, and sure, faith springs forth into action, and my entire being rises to meet the dawn. Let us affirm together, strong, swift, and sure, faith springs forth into action. Together. Strong, swift, and sure, faith springs forth into action, and my entire being rises to meet the dawn. And my entire being rises to meet the dawn. Last Sunday, Dr. Emma stepped with characteristic grace and ease into her new experience as her entire being rose to meet the dawn of her new experience. I am sure that her unwavering faith sprang forth into radiant action as her entire being merged with the infinite. She is now savoring the taste of pure freedom. And so after service today, we will be serving orange segments as a reminder for you to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. End of that scripture. And before I end, I have to give you your assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it this second Sunday in Advent, is to take some time today to think about and then make a list of the many ways God has been good to you over the course of your life. It's not just a gratitude list for what you got yesterday. I want you to think about the many ways God has been good to you over the course of your life. Include the names of people like Dr. Elmer who have taught you valuable lessons or have blessed you in other ways. And you might even want to include the bitter experiences that the taste wasn't so good, but which have turned out to be for your growth and greater good. And at the end of your musings, just write something simple like, thank you God for the sweet taste of freedom. Thank you God for the sweet taste of freedom. This Saturday, December 13th at 3 p.m., right here at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, which she built upon a foundation of faith hope, and undying love. We will celebrate this visionary Jamaican mystic, minister, teacher, trailblazer, wayshower, and friend. Oh, my friends, as we celebrate her, her onward journey into the light, let us taste and see that all that she taught us, all that she meant to us, has been the sweetness of God. Blessed is the man Blessed is the woman, blessed is the child that trusted in that truth. Namaste.